Hello and welcome to the channel Take One Tech. My name's Alec Johnson. So the purpose of this video is it's the first video that is on the channel and it's also the first time I'm live streaming and so it's going to be a bit of a case of me sort of finding my way around the uh, live streaming software and the process I'm afraid so uh, you'll have to bear with me on that one for the moment. Uh, now the title of this is live streaming on older gear and rather than a uh, sort of tutorial giving you all my insights after years of live streaming how to do this with older gear it's more just a statement that this is my first live stream and I'm doing it with older gear <laughs> so it's also a, a bit of a test bed really to find out exactly how that goes um, so I'll give you a bit of an introduction into the uh, the channel really since this is the uh, the first video and how it all sort of came about uh, and the name as well take one tech so for part of my uh, other work, my sort of primary work, if you like, I was needing to create some videos. Uh, I was creating an online course, uh, which I'm not going to use this channel to pitch that. Um, but I had to create some online video, co uh, some video content that was going to be putting online sort of behind a paywall for a um, uh, yeah, some, some training, basically. Now, the way I was doing that before was I was using my uh, DSLR camera to record videos and then I was editing all that in you know whatever software I was using on my computer. Um, the problem that that gave me was that uh, I'm, as you may have realized I'm not a professional broadcaster <laughs> and so my sort of on-screen technique in terms of making those videos you know it's it wasn't a case of going in and just getting it done in, in one take. Uh, what I found was that I've got this little switch in my brain which tells me that if I know that it can be edited later, then I'll tend to want to retake things, you know, even from, you know, the most basic of things like, let's say, you know, module one of the course, for example, hello and welcome to module one. Well, that's a pretty simple sentence to say, isn't it? And yet somehow, if I knew that I could edit myself later, I think, oh, that didn't sound very, very good. Let me uh, go back and redo that. And so, you know, a half hour module of this course, I probably had about three hours of footage. Uh, I mean, part of that was, you know, getting the content right as well. Uh, but a lot of it was just me kind of anticipating that I could edit myself. And yeah, what I was actually doing was I was kind of... Um, screwing over my future self <laughs> if you like because uh, I wasn't handing this off to a, an editor who would have been livid with me anyway for <laughs> creating so much uh, of, a, of a mess for him um, but it was actually me that was editing it and so then I would be faced with this really daunting task of having to go in and actually you know edit all this stuff together and so that turned what should have been a short editing task uh, into you know a massive undertaking to go and find all these little things that I needed to clip out stitch together and all that sort of stuff and then you get it not looking quite right so there's it creates all sorts of problems um, and so basically this project um, was something that you know I was not looking forward to because of that and as I say, I was recording this on my DSLR camera onto SD cards and copying it across. And I knew that it would be much better if I could find some way of actually just getting the, the feed into my computer. And it, I looked at uh, different ways to link up my, my camera to my computer. And at the time, the only thing was, uh, or, or the, only, the, the best solution for my uh, Mac I just have a quick look at what the software was. Um, it was a program called CamLive and CamTwist. So CamLive allows you to connect a uh, camera using a um, HDMI cable into your, uh, sorry, using the USB out from your camera into your computer, and then that can recognize the camera, and then CamTwist makes that available as a camera feed. Well, little did I know, <laughs> and I obviously didn't research it heavily. This was about two years ago. Um, you know, of all the other software, 
like OBS and things like that that you can use on your uh, computer to do exactly what I was wanting to do. I was a little bit probably uh, too old school in my thinking of how this needed to be done. And so, yeah, I did actually sort of struggle along with creating the content that way. And it came out fine, but it was just a, a nightmare to produce <laughs> because of the uh, the way that I had sort of set it all up for myself. Um, anyway, so come forward a couple of years and I needed to create some more content to add to this. And I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this. Well, in the interim, Canon has actually bought out um, their own EAS uh, webcam utility. So I should say, going back to the title, using older gear, um, what I'm actually using is a Canon EOS uh, 60D, and it's about 10 years old. I bought it when our first, we were expecting our first uh, daughter, and uh, so yeah, it was. Uh, that was the reason, so that's how I can remember quite clearly. It was 10 years ago, and I think probably when I bought it, being a bit of a... Uh, a geek and into tech and things like that. I think I probably had visions of me coming being, you know, a uh, not a professional photographer, but a very keen amateur photographer because, you know, a camera after all is kind of almost like the ultimate bit of tech after a, a computer in terms of, you know, as a gadget with, you know, all the settings and things like that. It's um, It's one of those things that you can really sort of dig into. Well, as it happens, I didn't dig into it. I found that I was too busy with work, with raising the kids, and I never really put aside the time to really get into uh, photography, I suppose. So although I've had this you know, really powerful camera for 10 years, uh, and I've taken thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures and videos on it, I would say I could probably count on one hand the number of photos that I actually took without using the auto settings and you know don't get me wrong the auto settings on it were great <laughs> but i've certainly not sort of unleashed the power of it and then obviously phone cameras got a lot better and it turned out that you know those were the cameras that we always had with us when we were wanting to snap pictures or take a little video uh, i rarely was carrying around this big uh, big lump of a camera with me so uh, but now it's getting a bit of a new lease of life, putting it to use for uh, for this purpose and also obviously for the videos that I created uh, before. So the uh, I'd, I've heard about the Anon, uh, Canon EOS webcam utility and that basically does a much better job of the sort of hack that I was using before to get the feed from the camera into the computer. So uh, I could probably just show you the uh, the website for that. Um, if I share my screen, then yeah, you just go to, uh, if, if you search for Canon EOS webcam utility, uh, then it'll take you to this page. And yeah, it's a free application. You just select whether you're on Windows or Mac, and then you can uh, download it from, uh, from there. And yeah, pretty easy to set up. And then yeah, it just shows up as a webcam in your, uh, in your list of cameras. So if you're using Zoom, or Microsoft Teams or anything like that, then you'll be able to use this as a camera. I don't think actually you can use it on FaceTime. If you do use FaceTime on your laptop or computer, uh, personally, I never do, but uh, I don't think that that will accept external sources on that one. Um, so yeah, the uh, so it's a Canon EOS. It's f uh, feeding into my laptop. And this is another thing that I've been uh, sort of a little bit concerned about is whether my laptop can actually handle what I'm going to be asking it to do in terms of creating all of this uh, content, doing the live streaming and so on. So I'm using a late 2013 MacBook Pro. Uh, at the time I got it, it was kind of maxed out. You know, I used to um, uh, used to do a lot of 3D work, and at the time this was uh, kind of top of the range. Um, but now it's I think technically obsolete. I think that Apple sort of end of lifed it um, a year or so ago. So it's uh, technically an unsupported old, let's call it an old Mac. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really a case of seeing how this handles the um, the streaming process and also the video production. Uh, and incidentally, coming back to I mentioned OBS. I'm not actually using OBS now for this stream and for the videos that I'm producing. I did go down that route and I went down the, you know, creating all the scenes, the transitions, all this sort of stuff that I needed for creating my uh, my online course content. 
Um, and it, it was all fine. I mean, it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's not entirely intuitive to use. You know, there's a bit of a learning curve to it. Um, for me, I love that sort of stuff because I love I love really digging into an app and I love technical apps. So, you know, I'm familiar with all those sorts of uh, things. So it wasn't uh, too challenging, but it just certainly wasn't a sort of uh, fully easy setup. And I can see how some people could get uh, sort of bogged down with it. Um, but yeah, I got some things set up the way that I wanted them. And then I did some recording. And what I noticed was that there was a bit of a, um, a sort of frame rate issue. Now, this isn't OBS's fault. It's my hardware. <laughs> I realized that. So I don't want to, you know, um, blame OBS too much for it. Um, but what I noticed is, yeah, there was a, a sort of judder in the frame rate. It wasn't very good. I went through all the sort of troubleshooting stuff that you would do for that. So, you know, did loads of searches online looking for solutions, looking for ways that I can improve that. Um, but what I found was, even in the recording that was coming out of it, um, there were still sort of issues with that. And it was, you know, down to my processor power, basically. But I'm not in the market for upgrading my laptop just yet. I'm kind of holding off for the 16-inch um, MacBook Pro with uh, M series chips the apple silicon chips so they've obviously released the um the 13 inch and the you know mac mini i know everyone talks about how great the m1 mac mini is for live streaming but i really do want the uh, the laptop um because i do have to travel quite a lot um or at least i say that i haven't traveled for a year <laughs> but when things get back to normal then uh yeah, there will be uh, there will be some occasions when I do need to travel, or you know, if I go to a coffee shop or something like that. So I don't want to buy a, a dedicated um, desktop M1 Mac just at the moment. So I'm kind of holding off, like I say, to see what comes out. So we are where we are, and I'm kind of using what I've got at hand. And the other thing is, obviously, you know, there's the expense of it. The whole point of this venture, in terms of the YouTube channel, I've made my videos now for the uh, the other thing. That I was talking about my uh, my online course. Uh, this is really kind of uh, grown into this channel, which is more of a kind of hobby thing. So I don't want to be uh, building out a full studio and anything like that just yet. And so I was kind of quite selective about what I did purchase in order to uh, to do this more effectively. And that's really what the video is about: is what I've used of existing. Um, equipment that I had and then how I've added to that with um, other things so uh, so I didn't use OBS so what did I use well I used um, Ecamm Live and what I've found with this is first of all uh, much as I like highly technical programs and really digging into them and things like that um, Ecamm Live is not that it is a immensely powerful but very easy to use and get your head round program. <laughs> so there isn't really much of a learning curve. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's a classic sort of uh, Mac app in that respect. You know, it just works and uh, very intuitive. So um, it's, yeah, what you expect from a native Mac app, really. Uh, sorry for any PC people out there. I know there's a a bit of a division in terms of which is best, but I've uh, I used PCs for um, well up until um, I guess up until Vista in uh, 2005, and then switched over to a Mac, and yeah, I've been very happy since then. <laughs> uh, so uh, so yeah, each to their own. But I'm using a Mac, and this is uh, this is what the uh, the channel's based on really is kind of productivity and getting things done on a Mac. Um, so. Ecamm Live is a Mac only app and yeah, it's really, really great. And what I found though is on my old machine, when I'm recording, especially if I'm doing, I mean, this is just uh, sort of me into the camera at the moment, but with the course, there is some uh, work that I do with presentations not like loads of text heavy slides but there's some stuff that I do use uh, PowerPoint for to illustrate points and things like that and when I'm running Ecamm with PowerPoint the, the, the computer's obviously maxing out on processor I mean now I'm at uh, around 55 58 percent processor 
uh, power um, usage. Um, so when I'm running PowerPoint as well, then that can get quite high. And what I noticed was the same as with OBS. When I'm actually when I look, if I look down now at my uh, the video uh, preview on Ecamm Live, then I'll notice uh, not now, but with when PowerPoint's running, I'll notice that there is you know there's a it looks like a low frame rate. Um, however, when I go back and look at the actual recorded video, it's fine. So it's obviously just sort of preserving some of the uh, uh, processor power for actually processing. And so that's why I'm, I'm getting that in the, um, in the preview. But like I say, um, I think if you look on, you know, supported hardware on the Ecamm website, uh, they'll recommend something a lot newer and more powerful than uh, what I'm using. But hey, you can be the judge for yourself. How does the, uh, how does the stream look to you? You know, how does the, um, the frame rate and uh, picture quality look? Uh, I am streaming this in 1080, uh, uh, 1920 by 1080. And, you know, I've got some graphic overlays and things like that that are on 1920 by 1080 as well. I know there's things you can do with that where if you sort of downsample those, then it can improve the, uh, the quality and things like sort of video overlays. So I've got like a, uh, a title uh, overlay. So for example, like this. So there you go, a little, uh, a little overlay there, the title uh, for, the, for the channel that I'll be using on some of the videos that I'm creating for this channel. And yeah, that's a 1080 video. And I do understand that I could sort of downsample that and to improve on uh, that because it's obviously having to, with Ecamm Live, it's actually taking that file and playing it over the top of the scene. So yeah, reducing the file size can help with things like that. So there we go. I'm using a old MacBook Pro and an old uh, Canon camera. And you know, these are the uh, the results I'm getting. Now, there was a couple of things that I did invest in, in terms of uh, starting to create these videos. Um, so the first thing that I know that is always important to get right, because when I'm watching YouTube videos myself, uh, I watch a lot of sort of explainer videos, uh, tutorials, things like that, general interest stuff. And uh, yeah, I can put up with picture quality being a little bit off sometimes. Uh, but if the sound's off, it really, uh, really throws me. And so I wanted to try and make sure that I could get the best uh, best quality sound, or at least, you know, not the, the best, but the best for a, a, a certain budget and with a couple of requirements as well. So obviously you see a lot of, uh, a lot of podcasters and YouTube channels these days using the Shure SM7B, which is obviously a, a kind of like industry standard almost. Um, and then there's lots of other, you know, lower end options. Now, when I created my, uh, my first set of videos, I was actually just using a Rode, uh, video mic go on top of the, uh, the camera. So it's kind of like a mini shotgun mic, a budget shotgun mic, if you like. And that was all right, but that gave me, um, a couple of issues in terms of sound quality where, um, because the room that I'm in is not uh, a, um, certainly not a treated room at, at all. In fact, I'm, I'm streaming from the basement of my house in the, uh, the north of Thailand. Uh, it's a concrete house, concrete basement. So you can almost imagine, in fact, I'm probably like half, half underground. <laughs> so I've got a, a concrete uh, retaining wall all around me so it's kind of like I'm I'm almost filming in a swimming pool <laughs> imagine a swimming pool then where they've built a concrete roof over the top of it as well uh, so yeah acoustically um, acoustically it's not the best <laughs> of environments to be uh, to be filming in and then also above me is our living room and I've got three yeah three young kids so if they're sort of running around and playing above then uh, yeah sound transmission is um, is not the best and then uh, from the, the the basement here there's uh, a door and some stairs that go up to the kitchen so another sort of noisy area of the house so it's certainly not ideal uh, filming in a concrete bunker basically with uh, by the way tiled walls <laughs> so it's, uh, it's it's not uh, not good at all um 
So yeah, I needed to uh, improve the sound quality. Like I said before, I was using the Rode Video Mic Go. Um, that needed a lot of sort of correction to the sound after it had come in, a lot of post-processing. I mean, adding on to all the editing that I was doing before, it, uh, you know, it probably paled into insignificance compared to the time spent on the editing, but still it was something that needed addressing. And so part of the, um, you know, reason for setting all this up for creating these other videos is that I wanted to, um, I wanted it to be as frictionless as possible, basically. And I thought, well, ideally, um, what I want to be able to do is just come sit down at the computer, stand at the computer, whatever, uh, get my notes ready, get my presentation ready and just, you know, deliver the course content. Um, cause you know, I've, I've delivered content on stage before, you know, I've got no, no issue with that. It's just this, this slight mental <laughs> deficiency where if I think that I'm recording it and I can take it again I will do so I thought well, let's let's figure out the way that I can just do it all straight to uh, tape <laughs> straight to the hard drive and then capture it that way and so yeah when I found out about Ecamm Live and it was just the, you know obviously the answer um, and then so then I was looking at, right, well, how do I actually um, get into doing the, you know, the transitions and overlays and things like that? Um, so then found out about the Stream Deck, which I'll talk about a bit later. And then, uh, yeah, I've been able to set up everything so that I can just do it all in one take. And obviously, hence the name, Take One Tech. Uh, so coming back to the sound, though, the microphone that I eventually settled on which obviously you can see is the Shure MV7, which I suppose is kind of like the uh, the uh, SM7B's little brother or sister. Um, now the reason why I settled on this one, because there are there are cheaper microphones than this, obviously, um, and there are more expensive ones. But the the thing that I wanted is I do see this channel growing into something bigger, um, and you know I've, I've, I'm intending to do that posting regular videos, having regular lives and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so at some point in the future, you know, I do see me expanding the gear that I'm using. And so looking at something like the uh, Rodecaster Pro, uh, you know, maybe an A10 Mini. Although I've been interested in the A10 Mini, so I'll be interested to see uh, if that is entirely necessary with the um, Ecamm Live software. By the way, the A10 Mini was another thing that I looked at before the software solution. So, um, but we'll see how that goes. But anyway, so in terms of audio, yeah, uh, I can see the advantage to something like the Rodecaster uh, Pro and having an audio interface. Uh, but for the moment, I just wanted something that I can plug into my uh, computer and go, basically. Um, and so the thing that was appealing about the Shure MV7 is, excuse the sound a minute, if you can see at the back, it does actually have um, the, the USB uh, out. So that goes straight into my laptop at the moment, but it does also have the XLR uh, connection as well. So what that means is, uh, excuse me for the sound quality, uh, that what that does mean is that at some point in the future, if I want to take this out to, um, you know, through an audio interface, an external audio interface, then I can actually do that with uh, using the XLR. But it gives me the flexibility to use it on USB as well. And as I mentioned, I do uh, travel uh, when uh, conditions are, are okay for it. And so I wanted something that would be a bit more sort of compact that if I just need to take it with me, then I can uh, always plug it into my computer without having, you know, another load of uh, connections and accessories to take with me. Um, so in terms of the microphone itself, I've been very happy with it really. I mean, it obviously sounds a lot better than uh, uh, the video mic go that I was using. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite good. I like the, uh, the interface for it. So there is a, um, let me just show you this quickly. to bear with me a little minute. I should have thought about this in advance. Uh, but yeah, if I share my screen, you can see that when you've got the uh, the mic open, then you have a, uh, 
you have a little app that you can use to control the gain, the, uh, the mix between the mic and the playback, different EQ options. I'm going to do a whole video about this uh, at some point in the future because there has been a, uh, a firmware update since uh, a lot of the videos that were produced about it. Uh, let me just bring this down. Do, do, there we go. So yeah, basically with the uh, the firmware update that came out, I think it was around about a month ago, something like that, they added a couple of features, which is live meters and night mode. So uh, yeah, as I say, I'll cover this all in another another video. But basically you have some, um, some uh, lights along the top, which sort of show you the uh, the mic gain and also the uh, the audio volume uh, but then they added on live meters so that these lights can also act as a sort of uh, uh, live metering of the the uh, volume and then they've also added night mode to dim these lights as well um, so that is the mic so just in terms of the sound quality that's coming out of it with um, just plugged straight into the laptop I've been very very happy with it really uh, and I also Another reason for this setup is that I do, uh, obviously, with uh, what's been happening over the last year, then I've been doing a lot more of my work uh, remotely and having meetings and things like that. So another sort of motivation for getting this all right was obviously to be able to uh, make more of an impression on meetings, uh, improve the sound quality, because uh, I get so frustrated myself if... Um, you're on a meeting with somebody and then there's loads of echo coming back or the sound quality is not good. Um, it's uh, it's a bit distracting and it kind of does, um, it ruins the flow of meetings. So and that's another thing that I'll be covering on the channel is how to actually use this technology to improve, um, improve meetings for you. Uh, so next thing that I... Um, uh, I bought to improve the the quality of uh, my productions was uh, was some lights. Now, <clears throat> I watch loads of videos on you know ideal lighting for video shooting for um, creating content and things like that, and producing videos for YouTube for live streams. And there's all kinds of um, lights that you can get these days, and a great channel for all anything to do with this is uh, Caleb Pike's uh, channel DSLR Video Shooter. I really love his uh, uh, his range of videos. Really, so he covers the you know really really high end stuff, but he also you know talks about you know how to create a uh, you know a, a live streaming setup on a single desk. And there's all these different things. He's got one that he did you know how to create a live shoot streaming setup that just fits in a Pelican case. Recently, that was a great one. Um, so yeah, there's loads of great advice. Now, what what he always talks about on there with the lighting is, you know, if you've got your big uh, key light, then usually he's using some sort of big uh, you know, lantern style uh, softbox, and they'll say bring it into the frame so it's just in the frame, and then push it back slightly so that it's just out of the frame, and that's how close he would recommend having it. Uh, and that's you know pretty sort of standard thing. But my um, my whole thing is that. I need this setup to be flexible, that it is my working desk, and I don't really want to have big lights sort of in my face, if you like, you know, right there. Uh, I'd like to have a bit of space behind, uh, behind the monitor. So I've got my desk actually set up in the middle of the room. Uh, it's quite a, you know, it's a small room, so four meters by three meters. So what's that, you know, 12, 14 foot by 10 foot something like that uh, but my desk is right in the middle of it so I've got a bit of space behind and a bit of space in front of me I don't like being right up to a wall like that but then I didn't want to have you know lights on stands all over the place uh, or like I say right in my uh, in my field of view uh, or they are in my field of view because obviously they're shining on me but you know what I mean not just right in my face and so what I did is I got a couple of, uh, they're just, they're not uh, expensive. You know, at some point, yeah, it'd be great to have aperture lights everywhere and all have them controlled by a central, uh, you know, app, something like that, that can dim them all up and down and change the color and the warmth and things like that. But for the moment, like I say, it's a kind of uh, uh, low budget 
initial setup that I'm using. So I just got a couple of soft boxes that are um, non-branded. They're the kind of like rectangular. I'll, I'll do a video where I actually do a proper walkthrough or talk through of my, my setup. But yeah, they're just the sort of, you know, rectangular uh, soft boxes. Uh, inside they are, uh, they are, <laughs> you can adjust the color temperature of them because actually they've got four screw in uh, 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 fittings for standard light bulbs. So in theory, you can change the warmth of them and temperature by changing the bulb. And if you want to vary between it, you could have two of one and one of another or another and another one. So, uh, yeah, that's how we, <coughs> excuse me, that is how we uh, change the, the lighting. They've got two switches on the back of, it, of them so that you can uh, have either two lights on or the other two or whatever. Uh, to the bulbs rather so that's how you change the brightness so that is where we are in terms of the lighting technology <laughs> now they did come with uh, you know light stands with the little uh, you know the sort of spigot that you have on the top to mount the the, the light onto uh, but I didn't like those uh, around in the uh, in the office in the studio uh, especially as I say I've got three young kids um, two five and nine so uh, yeah, when they come in, they do tend to sort of trip over things. So what I did was I actually mounted the lights right back into the corner of the room. Um, I made a little uh, a little bracket with um, uh, just a, just shelf brackets, but then I bought a couple of the um, the spigots. So these are the uh, the sort of spigots that lights fit onto, and then I just basically bolted that through. Uh, onto the uh, the angle bracket and so now I've got my lights mounted back on the wall but what that means is oh and then I, I ran the, the cabling round to my uh, to the side of my desk so that I can switch them on and off for here and the reason for that is like I said I wanted them out of the way for when I was doing my um, you know just general work I want to be able to not have to think about it too much them not be in my face but then if I have to sort of jump on a Zoom call or something like that, then I can just switch them on and I'm ready to go. I've got my camera mounted up here above my uh, my monitor, obviously. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that, is, that is the main the use for them. I have calls every day. And so it just means that I'm always ready to jump on a call. So that was the, uh, the other thing that I bought. And then, as I say, in terms of the... Uh, like another big investment, I suppose, for the uh, the channel um, was the Stream Deck. I got the Stream Deck XL, and I say for the channel, but really I use it mainly for productivity. Uh, it's it's obviously built for streamers, hence the name. Um, but and if you haven't seen uh, what the Stream Deck looks like, I'm guessing probably most of you have. Here we go. It's a uh, whoopsie daisy. It is a little panel with a series of, um, uh, actually a series of screens, but there are buttons, but each button is in itself a little screen. So there are, um, you can basically program to do these, whatever you want. So you can assign them to keyboard shortcuts. You can assign them to uh, different actions, have them open an app, close an app, or in the case of uh, Ecamm Live, what I'm doing is I've got them programmed to scenes. So I've got my normal scene here, or I can zoom in uh, like this. Uh, whoops, I've obviously just changed my, uh, <laughs> changed my scene from the top down shot. So here I am actually, I'm actually on the, uh, the top down shot. So yeah, it's not very good lighting. The, uh, the, the overhead camera that I'm using is just a, um, uh, Logitech C, uh, is it C290? I forget now. Just the standard Logitech camera that everyone seems to use. Um, so that was the one that I was previously using on my computer. And so when I installed my Canon as the primary camera, then that meant that was available. So I thought I'd repurpose that for these top down shots. Uh, but yeah, if I, like for example, the lower third that I've got on there, if I press this button, then it'll appear or disappear or my uh, buy me a coffee link. That's a great excuse to just drop that in there. Uh, so yeah, the, you can program these buttons to do whatever. Um, and yeah, that's, um, it's been really useful for, for this. And so for the video production, then obviously I use this in when I'm creating my, um, uh, 
videos for uh, the course. Then I use this for different transitions and things like that, different, you know, bringing up different graphics or when I have to play in video and things like that. I can control it all by here. Uh, the video does have, you know, a bit of sort of intro music, title music, background music, outro and all that sort of stuff. There's a little out, out, outro uh, animated logo and things like that. And so I can do that all from uh, the stream deck. So like on this channel, I anticipate that I'll do, uh, you know, my top five apps for productivity and things like that. And so I've created little uh, animations for that. And they're all operated from the stream deck. So like if I was to do a you know, top five, we might start with number five. And so I created these, um, these animations and I actually created them in Keynote, <laughs> believe it or not. So all of the animations, all of the, uh, the things that I've done here are, are done using uh, Keynote. Obviously the, uh, the, the top down, not so much. So these uh, frames that I've got when I do a top down shot so the actual frame that's sort of around me at the moment uh, that was created in, in Photoshop uh, or edited, I should say, in Photoshop and Illustrator rather. Um, but yeah, things like that or obviously you've the obligatory, uh, you know, don't forget to like and subscribe. So all these little animations I've just done in Keynote and I do have um, Adobe, uh, <laughs> Adobe Creative Suite so, you know, I've got all of the Adobe tools at my disposal for video editing, for, um, you know, creating graphics and things like that. Um, but I just used Keynote because it's what I had. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it was the easiest way for me to get something put together because I've used Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator for, for years, but I wasn't so familiar with the um, the other software packages for creating graphics and things like that, 3D graphic, uh, uh, animated graphics and things like that, it wasn't something I'd done before. So, whereas I have done, you know, God knows how many presentations, <laughs> uh, so it was just the easiest way. And a lot of the thing about this channel is that it is intended to be. Um, uh, you may have heard that, like the acronym MVP. Uh, minimum viable product now it's a it's a bit of a um this obviously isn't the minimum viable product because uh, minimum viable product to stream to youtube is sitting in front of your mobile phone and switching the camera on and you know going live so uh, it isn't in that sense but for me um, one of the things I've got in my bio is that I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I do tend to have a habit of um, fussing over the final details before getting something out that I tend to like everything to be you know, absolutely perfect. And so bearing that in mind, you'll understand uh, what a big step forward it is to release content like this, which is far from perfect. <laughs> um but yeah, so that is why I just sort of threw some titles together. And this is, I suppose, my minimum viable product uh, that I can release and be okay with. At some point in the future, I'll go and, uh, you know, update all the graphics, my um, uh, title sequence and all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, just put something a bit, uh, a bit better in there. But I figured, well, the main thing that I need to sort out first is actually creating the content streaming the content and getting uh, getting more comfortable with that process and just sort of yeah getting used to actually the the sort of mechanics of it um but yeah the uh, the the stream deck having waffled on a little bit is something that i have uh, i've created a, a whole load of um uh specific graphics for specific applications for this so like i just uh, i'll just quickly show you again all of the icons for uh, for for this are icons that i've uh, created myself for you know specific scenes and things like that so uh, i've also done some for you know for powerpoint for excel for uh, different applications that i use for productivity and so i will be sort of creating icon packs for those um that I'll I'll make available for download things like that, and then I'll do a run through on how I'm using 
the Stream Deck, uh, but not just for streaming, but specifically for productivity. In fact, I've got a whole series of videos that I want to do, which is uh, specifically Stream Deck and uh, yeah, the uh, the use cases I've got for it and how to get the uh, you know results out from it. So I suppose the uh, other thing that I wanted to sort of touch on, having sort of briefly gone through, you know, my, my camera, uh, my laptop, the stream deck, the microphone, the lighting, is um, just to talk a little bit about um, exactly what content I'm going to be producing going forward. I've sort of alluded to it, but I don't think I've actually said in detail, uh, you know, what the, the, the overall direction is to the uh, the channel and I suppose in in that sense it probably helps to give a little bit of background so I've had quite a, um, uh, a sort of varied career if you like and if you look on my uh, my bio on uh, the YouTube or whatever platform and on our, my website uh, takeonetech.io uh, I describe myself <laughs> as a recovering perfectionist which I've mentioned a uh, uncertified polymath, <laughs> uh, which is that, you know, I do have a really quite a diverse range of interests and experiences. Um, and also describe myself, obviously, as a professional geek. And so my career has spanned, uh, so I started in uh, mechanical engineering with a specialized, uh, specialism in aeronautics, aeronautical engineering. I've worked for a missile defense contractor uh, who designed seeker systems and guidance systems for missiles. Uh, that was very uh, early on in my uh, my career. And I still have um, one of my friends still introduces me today as a former rocket scientist, <laughs> which uh, which wasn't true then. And it certainly isn't true now, sort of 25 years later. Uh, but, yeah, that was so that was sort of design engineering. Uh, I work for uh, a pharmaceutical company, which was in a more sort of supply chain management uh, department role. Um, then I did uh, graphic design, web design for a number of years, uh, because what you'll find is, uh, or, or with me, it's uh, I've got a, quite a passion for sort of design and design aesthetics, uh, but also engineering. And so there is a sort of common thread that runs through all of these. And so after I'd finished with my, um, I actually moved over to Thailand 15 years ago and I was doing the web design and graphic design. And then over here, I actually set up an architectural design and construction company. And that was around about 10 years ago, 13 years ago, perhaps. And yeah, in that time, we've built, you know, about 40 or 50, designed and built 40 or 50 houses, uh, designed more than more than that for for other people uh designed a couple of hotels um yeah so that was um largely uh that you know i was the 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 primary designer in that uh, in that business and the uh construction was something that i oversaw as well so again it's kind of the um the design creator inside me <laughs> and then more recently my focus has been actually on um, mathematical modeling of financial systems and uh, designing algorithmic trading models so that's something that uh, that's uh, that's effectively the day job if you like uh, and that's what my primary focus is on and where I spend most of my time um, but all of these things, although they're in quite varied fields, really, you know, um, uh, rocket science, mechanical engineering, uh, financial modeling, they're all basically uh, mathematics, engineering and design and aesthetics. So, you know, I do a lot of uh, work, especially now with uh, spreadsheets, but in every single role, there was always spreadsheets involved somewhere obviously from the the engineering work to um uh designing houses you know the design work okay that was done in 3d modeling uh, uh, packages but then actually all the costings and things like that i developed uh, excel sheets that would basically you know i could calculate the um 
the bill of materials, the costs of everything, uh, and cost uh, you know a full house in you know a day or so, um, just because I'd structured my uh, Excel sheets in that way. In the same way with all the financial modeling stuff, that's very Excel heavy, uh, using things like Power Query and stuff like that to um, to do a lot of uh, advanced modeling, and uh, that's something else that you know I'll. There is a, a is a place for, but I think that that is probably for another channel, to be honest, rather than here, because um, I don't want to, uh, you know, Excel sheets are fine, and I'm a bit of an Excel geek, but they're not for everybody, so I don't think I want to burden everybody on a general uh, tech channel with uh, with the things I love about Excel. But yeah, maybe maybe for another channel. But yeah, so the thing that's the thing that sort of runs through all these is, like I say, design, engineering, um, and aesthetics. Uh, but at the core, it is ha- problem solving. Really, every one of those things is just how do we solve this particular problem, uh, and that is just for everything. So that's the other part on my bio: um, uncertified polymath, recovering perfectionist, professional geek. Uh, and problem solver and that's what it comes down to and the thing that is consistent in all of those as well is computer technology and it's how to solve the problems that we've got in our lives with uh, using the tools that we've got and using our our Macs and so that's really the thrust of the the channel is all of these things that we do day to day and how can we uh, improve our productivity using the Mac uh, because that's what I'm on. There are ways to do it on a PC, so I don't want to start a flame war here, but <laughs> I'm a Mac guy. And so, um, yeah, I'll be covering things like that. So I'm, I'm doing a lot with video production at the moment, so there will be parts of it that are about things like Ecamm Live and how I'm, how I'm doing that, my setup, but then also just general stuff on the Mac, the productivity apps that I use, uh, some of the sort of menu bar apps that I use to get... Um, to help my productivity, how I'm using Stream Deck with my uh, general work productivity as well as the video production stuff. And uh, yeah, that's really the uh, the sort of thrust of the the, the drive behind the tran- channel really is just to produce that sort of content. Now, what I'm expecting as well is uh, it is um, it is a niche in some respects, uh, but it could be a narrower niche. Um, so what I will probably do is I'll see how things go over the uh, you know I've got so I've got videos lined up in terms of live stream videos but also you know produced specific produced uh, videos so I'll see how the reaction to those goes and then decide on you know if I want to slightly adjust the direction of the channel based on viewer feedback really so uh, I suppose that is an ideal uh uh, an ideal point to say, you know, if you have got any uh, <laughs> struggling to find my, uh, there we go, still not quite used to exactly where my buttons are for this particular one yet. Uh, yeah, so if you have got, you know, want to like and subscribe to the channel, and yeah, please leave any comments, feedback, or anything like that. It will really help because, uh, as I say, I'm I'm banking on uh, getting some. Uh, feedback to help me decide the future direction of the channel so go ahead leave any comments good or bad let me know what you think of the uh, quality of the video and any issues that you found with it and I'll be happy to improve to make things better I'll be doing these live streams every week at uh, one or two a week actually from just trying to figure out the best time so I'm at, as I mentioned I'm in uh, the north of Thailand so it's kind of like five four in the morning five in the morning here for me and so i'm streaming these so they're going out at a sort of better time for the uh, us and uk Uh, but we'll see how that goes i might play around with the time as well on that but for the moment uh yeah fridays 5 uh, 30 in the afternoon evening us uh, eastern time and yeah it'll be same time next week so in the meantime please feel free to leave any comments you've got and uh, i'll see you on the next one